Hi, welcome to my latest video podcast, which is you've got your business ready to sell. How do you sell it? Um, I have mentioned probably a lot on my podcast that um, a lot of the people that come to me to uh, set up a recruiting business, their eventual goal is to sell it. Um, I've done quite a bit on that, but um, the subject I haven't covered is how would you actually sell it when you get to that point? Because um, it's not as easy as, um, I don't know, sticking your house with an estate agent or advertising on the internet. It, it's, it's very complicated because the valuation of a recruiting business is a lot more intricate because you're buying something um, that has a lot of moving parts like people that can leave or like a house that could fall apart. So it's actually a lot more complicated than people think. But also what I think um, is lost on a lot of people who have this dream of building a recruiting business is that once you've built your recruiting business, you will find a buyer. Uh, fact. Well, that isn't the case. Um, you, you need to find somebody who wants to buy your business, which may seem like a stupid thing to say. But why would somebody want to buy your business? Now, unless your business is, for example, £100 million turnover, it might be uh, down to finding the right match. Because uh, if you've got a business that is a, a huge critical mass, then your market for who's going to buy it is more open to people like venture capitalists, people like that. Uh, but if you're looking for more of a trade sale, so you're looking for uh, a recruitment business to buy your business, there's got to be a match. Which is why uh, I mentioned before that um, the sal- saleability of your business will be increased if you are more niche. Because quite often businesses will want to buy a niche rather than trying to move into that area themselves. So the smaller the business, the more you're looking for the perfect buyer. Now, you can, obviously, you can sell your business two ways. You can have an unsolicited uh, inquiry about, for somebody to buy your business, or you can actually take it to market. And the, the podcast I'm doing today is about taking it to market. Because the unsolicited one, uh, well, fair enough, you're just going to get one out of the blue. If you get one out of the blue, you still want to get a corporate financier involved who are the people that sell you recruiting business because they will help you with get the valuation right. They'll help you with the actual sales process. They are the experts. But also at that point, if you do get an unsolicited offer, what I would suggest you do is you still take it to market anyway to see what the market's going to get for you. But having been through the sales process myself before, I know it was not at all what I expected. It was a fuck's sake harder than I expected and it was really really painful and it can be really stressful as well so I thought it was worthwhile doing a podcast to explain what's entailed so initially what you do is you get your business and you go to what's called a corporate finance you know a corporate finance is is um the the chap or lady that will represent your business in the market they will take it to market and they will try and find would-be buyers so preferably you could for somebody who knows the recruitment market um what they will do before they take it to market is they do a sort of a forensic search of your business to put together something called an information memorandum. And what that is, that's that's a detailed report to give to would-be buyers that explain the uh, the metrics within your business, how your turnover was like, the profits like, the number of staff, uh, key accounts, marketing. It, it's, it's a fairly thick um, document that goes to would-be buyers to explain what it is they're buying. Because like I say, it's not like you're buying a house or a car. It, it's a lot more sophisticated than that. So the uh, the corporate finances will go through your business in great detail and drag out all the data that a would-be buyer want to, to see. Now, the would-be buyers, they are going to be very sophisticated business people. They're going to know what they're looking for. They're going to know what they're talking about. So the corporate finances should be preempting what they're looking for. Now, I've been th- through the process myself, like I say, of putting together the information memorandum, and it is really painful. It is to go into so much detail. You think, why do you really need all this detail? But it's really, really detailed. And one of the things you can do to make the information information memorandum, which is hard to say, gathering process easier, is going back to the beginning, which I've said before in previous cases, is you build your business as if you're going to sell it. So if you do then take it to sale, it's worth more money. And part of what you need for your information memorandum is a, an awful lot of data. A lot of financial data, a lot of uh, statistics, a lot of ratios, a lot of numbers, because um, most business owners for buying a recruitment group will, will buy it by numbers. Um, they'll be interested as clearly in things like culture and the personalities, but a lot of what they're buying can be judged with numbers. So it's having those um, really detailed reports on how the business is run. Um, and it's building that into the business as you go along rather than trying to do it historically. You'll also find, and certainly I found, 
is when I was putting together the information memorandum, the questions they ask opened your eyes on things that you should have been measuring and are important. Like, I know, for example, um, what percentage of your business is with a small number of clients, what your staff attrition, what the exact staff attrition is, um, where exactly your business comes from. I forget, there's, there's, there's an awful lot of questions that they ask you, which, which helped me understand that, okay, well, maybe I should have, I should have known those before at the start of the process, because those particular metrics are things as a business owner you should be measuring anyway. Um, I've done various podcasts on marketing. Some of those are involved as well. Some of them uh, are things like average debtor days, which you should know anyway, but more accountancy type stuff. So those are the things that you need to be aware of. So rather than go into too much detail on that, because it, what I don't want to do is, is, to, is to make this podcast massive because the subject is massive. But um, I always try and keep a podcast to a reasonable length of about 15 minutes because um, I've, 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 I've found out that most people I think can get 15 minutes and then switch up a little bit. So I try and keep them short. Um, so with this particular one, it is more of a taste. Also, I do caveat it that what I'm doing is I'm generalizing quite a bit. Um, because it depends on the size of the business, depends on the market, depends on what your motives are. There's an awful lot that goes into it. So you're just going to have to bear with me. A lot of this is sort of generalist advice. So anyway, you've gone to your corporate financer, you've got the information random, and then he'll discuss with you what the target markets are and he'll take them to market. Now, it could be quite frankly emails. It can be, um, it can be he makes phone calls to people, but he'll take it to would be buyers. Then it gets to the point where you get some would-be buyers that express to the corporate financer, yes, I'm interested in that business. And they have to sign an NDA to get the information memorandum to then see what the business is. So they look through the information, like, oh, okay, okay, that, that I'm interested. I want a buyer's meeting. And I've been to these buyer's meetings because I've been through the process. And again, those can be really painful because you are a self-made business owner and you're not used to answering to anybody else. And then you'll sit in front of somebody, or more often than not people, who will then rip apart your information memorandum, ask you a load of questions, and sometimes it can be quite uncomfortable that um, you don't feel you should be put under that kind of interview type pressure. But you've got to understand, if these people are part of millions of pounds, they're going to put you through the mill. So you kind of swallow that. Um, and once you've been through that, uh, those buyers meetings, that's when hopefully you're going to get some offers. Now, those will be indicative offers. Uh, and also what you've got to steer yourself for is some of them will be uh, quite frankly piss take we had a few of those um, and there also can be incredibly varied in in the type of offer because again if you never looked at selling your business before I don't know a lot about it it's not like somebody comes along and goes here's five million quid off your pop it tends to be a, uh, more often than not you get a chunk up front and then the rest of it is on stage payments depending on your business hitting targets which is called an earn out the earn out is tends to be when you stay within the business during that period to hit those targets uh, i was fortunate enough that i built the business to the point i didn't need to be there at all and secured the buyout so i could just walk out the door that day but that's not really that 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 usual uh, although what you can do um, is if you have been successful with the succession plan is you get a chunk up front then you get the stage payments but you don't actually have to stay in the business you're more retained as a consultant um, so yeah, so when you get the offers, they'll all be weird and wonderful and, and, um, and you can narrow it down to, uh, to, to which business you want to talk to. This is again where your corporate finance gets involved and this is where you narrow it down to who you actually want to speak to. Now this is where the area becomes a little bit greyer because again, it depends on the type of the business, um, and how the sale is going to go through. But what tends to happen at that point is you agree something called heads of terms, with the would be buyer, and then ahead of terms, a case of right, we agree this is basically what the deal is, unless there are things that come out further down the line that change that deal. How things can change is once you've got your heads of terms, is you you go into a period of what's called due due diligence. Can't say it today. Due diligence, and this is where the would be buyer goes into real detail in your business, absolutely forensic, way over the top of the information around them, looking at everything. What I have been told uh, by the experts in this market is a lot of the detail they go into is to cover the lawyers' bums and the accountants' bums, um, and more so with venture capitalists. But it is a case of satisfying the experts rather than necessarily the would-be buyers. But the would-be buyers have to uh, rely on the experts, so they will go through massive detail in your business, and quite often they do that so they can chip you on the price. Um, because you might think that that doesn't happen when you're buying a business. It happens when you're selling a house or a car, but it's more prevalent when you're selling a business. So put somebody will go through it and say, okay, well, here's a weak link. Here's something we're concerned about. We want to adjust the price. And that's when it can start to get really, really painful. Um, they talk about, I think it's death, 
marriages and divorce are the most stressful things um, you could experience. I've been through the sales process, and it is massively stressful. I know other people that have been through it, and it is really, really stressful. So it's not as romantic as you might think that you just swan through this, somebody turns up, give you a check, and everything is lovely. It's hard, bloody work. So anyway, they've been through all the due diligence, and then you eventually you've agreed a price, and you've agreed a deal. And that's when it comes to actually going ahead with the deal. Um, when you get to the point of doing the deal, um, the amount of documents you will have to sign will be like a book signing. Um, when I went to the solicitor to do the, the signing, it was like a huge boardroom and it was just full of documents. And the solicitor started with one and said, this is what this is. Okay, fine. I'll start signing that. This is what this is. Okay, right. And then by the fourth one, I just went, I don't care. I just, 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 let's just get all these signed. So you get all these documents signed and then you go into the period after that where you get your chunk of money. And then you can have your earn out where you're working for the business to set targets. It can be a consultant to get the money over a period of time. It could be you've had all of it up front. It can be various things. Um, and that is pretty much where the process ends. At that process then, this is this is where I'm going to give the caveats where there's more, some more of the reasons why I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of selling businesses. Is certainly if you're on an earn out, you're not used to being a boss and you've got a boss. And that is going to be uncomfortable. If that particular boss is changing things within the business that you don't like, people start to leave, it's incredibly uncomfortable as well. So if you can secure an exit from the business such that you're not involved at that point, that is desirable. But fast forward into that, uh, rather than give you um, I don't know, a horror story of how that could turn out, it obviously it's on case by case. But there's also something that I think is, is very relevant um, to the people that have this uh, idea of selling a business and, and sailing off into the sunset and retiring. I could speak from per personal experience that after I sold my business, I went into depression for about three months. Um, and the reason for that is um, obviously I had um, a reason for being. Um, I had, um, you know, I had the ego and the chemicals that go with running a business with being, you know, when you walk into the room, people are looking at you because you own the business, the funniest guy in the room, you know, you're busy all the time. Um, you know, you, you, it's who you are. You're a successful business owner. And as much as I like to think I'm a humble person, it's nice to feel important. You can't deny it. it's not nice to feel important. So when I sold the business, I literally signed all the documentation, went to the office, packed up my box and left. And that was, it was gone. Went on holiday, came back, a couple of three weeks, loved it. And then suddenly it dawned on me, Monday's like Sunday. Now, it didn't help the fact that I train a lot. Um, I had an Achilles injury that meant I couldn't train. I had an elbow injury that meant I couldn't train. So I couldn't do any training. And I didn't effectively have a job. Um, and I didn't want to develop a drinking habit and not like golf. So, um, but joking apart, the chemical drop that I had from being um, feeling important because I was a businessman, being in office, in, interacting with people, just to working from home, doing a bit of non-exec work was a big drop. Now, I'm not getting the violin out and saying, oh, I suffered mental health with that. It's very, very common. Um, I've spoken to a number of people that sold the business and it is that, okay, I, I'm going to sell a business, I'm going to move to the countryside, um, I'm going to do lots of walks and get fit and go on long holidays and all that kind of stuff. The problem is, if, is, is if you built a business to sell, you're a very highly driven individual. So that means you're used to being busy. It means you're used to making decisions. It means you're used to being important. And then suddenly you're not. Okay. And that is a big change you've got to get used to. Now, the way I can describe it is if you are driving 100 mile an hour, you're screeching to a halt of nothing like that. Okay. The more sensible way is, is if you're easing out of a job rather than necessarily going from 100 mile an hour to nothing. I can't say that um, that is the case with everybody. Some people, I'm sure, have sold the businesses, gone to live in the south of France, have been happy as a pig in poo. Um, I do know uh, two individuals, actually, that have sold the businesses, and that's what they did. Not necessarily moved to France, but basically went on a holiday for the rest of their lives. Um, and they loved it. Um, so it's not the same for everybody. But what I would say is... Selling your business is maybe not as glamorous as, as you might think. It's a lot harder work than you might think. Um, I'm not trying to put people off. As I say, I personally don't advocate selling businesses because my thought process is if you've got a business that somebody wants to buy, then it's not going to fall apart. It's recurring revenue. You're going to get four times profit if it's perm, maybe 10 times, eight times profit if it's contract, something in between if it's both. But if you've got a strong management team, then why not give them some equity and tie them in so they can run it 
So then you've got a cash cow going forward and they may have more energy, better ideas than you. You can stand as a CEO. So therefore, you've still got some involvement in the business. You've still got that ego thing going on, which we all have. You know, it, it's difficult to switch that off. Um, you've then got the, uh, the activity for your brain, you know, because you still involve the business to a degree. So that, that for me is a, is a preferred option. But as I said earlier on, what I do with the businesses that I work with, we build them as if we are going to sell them. So if you do want to sell them, we can sell them. But that that structure that a would-be buyer wants, the constituent parts of would-be buyer wants, low staff attrition, uh, your, your client spread out, uh, good financial accounting, um, great branding, strong management team, all those great things. These are the things you need in a successful business. So you build it as if you're going to sell it because that's a wise thing to do. This particular podcast is explaining actually what you do do if you're going to sell it because it's not quite as simple as people might think. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of people who sold businesses and have been happy and done that. Um, I sold a business because I basically fell out of love with my job. Um, I can also understand people that want to build a business to sell it because it's a sense of achievement. Now, there's various different reasons. But what I've also found is the vast majority of people that sell businesses, not long after, they start doing it again. Um, now, there's nothing wrong with selling the business to then obviously do it again. But what I would say is um, don't think that... Um, it is as seamless and as romantic um, as a sort of thing that you might envisage. So I hope that helps uh, if you're thinking about selling your business. I hope it's not too negative because I'm a very positive person, but um, th- there's no other way I can paint the sales process and take it a business to sale than the reality that it is. Um, I think also your disposition affects how how it affects you uh, as to whether you're the type of person that enjoys that kind of thing. Um, and like I say, it, it is quite stressful, but it's more... The bit at the end where uh, once you've sold the business, what do you do next? So clearly, if you can plan some sort of exit post-sale that isn't necessarily just sitting in the sun, if it is going to non-exec, maybe do charitable work, maybe maybe get involved with some small business. What I do now, I, I, I help startups. What I do is I back recruiters and help them build their own businesses. Uh, and quite frankly, I've never been happier. Uh, happier than I was in my own recruitment business. But it took me a few months to, to realize that's what I wanted to do. So that's something maybe to think of, of as well. But anyway, I, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. As I always say, uh, with the podcast, if you're on uh, YouTube, then like it, follow the page, leave nice comments. The same if it's if it's an audio download. Um, and if you do want to get any of my new content, any of my new blogs, new video podcasts or podcasts first, send me your email address. Go on our mailing list. We don't do any spam or anything like that. Uh, and you'll get them first. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. See you soon.